If you've been listening to the Business of Biotech podcast for a while now, you'll recall that Aaron Harris has joined me to co-host a few episodes. Aaron's my friend, colleague, and chief editor over at CellandGene.com, and she just recently launched a podcast of her own. It's aptly named Cell and Gene, the podcast. And if you're working in the Cell and Gene space, you should give it a listen. It's a collection of interviews with the industry and academic leaders moving the space forward. And you can find it at CellandGene.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Cell and Gene, the podcast. Check it out. Breakthroughs are the name of the game in biotech. Everyone in the business is looking for them, but only a select few when breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. On today's episode, we're going deep on breakthrough therapy designation, from what it is, to when, how, and why you should apply, to what to do when your application falls flat. Joining me for the conversation are two women who are incredibly qualified to share their insight on the topic. While the awarding of breakthrough therapy designations have been few and far between, GSK has a few of them under its belt on these ladies' watch. Ira Gupta, MD, is a VP and medicine development leader at GSK, which she rejoined in 2018 after leaving the company in 2015 to spend a few years working as global clinical program head at Novartis and executive medical director at Celgene. From 2002 to 2015, her roles at GSK included head of clinical operations and senior medical director. Also joining us is Shanti Ganeshan, PhD. She's formerly VP of Global Regulatory Affairs at GSK, and she just recently joined Gilead as head of regulatory for oncology. She's also a Novartis alum, having spent 13 years there in various regulatory affairs positions most recently VP and U.S. Head of Drug Regulatory Affairs. Drs. Gupta and Ganeshan, thanks for coming on the show. I'm really honored that you're both here with us today. Thank you for having us, Matt. And likewise, Matt, thanks for having us and happy to be here with you today. Yeah, the honor is, is definitely ours. Uh, and we've got a, a whole bunch to cover today on, on breakthrough therapy designations. So let's jump into it. Uh, Dr. Gupta, if, if you're good, I'd like to start with you. Um, I want to talk about assessing the eligibility for uh, a, a product for breakthrough designation. So how do you, how do you determine uh, that it's an appropriate path to take? Sure. So, you, you know, as per the FDA, breakthrough designation is one of the pathways to expedite the development and the review of drugs for serious or life-threatening conditions. So we follow the criteria for breakthrough uh, therapy de designation, which requires preliminary clinical evidence that the drug shows substantial improvement on at least one clinically significant endpoint over the currently available therapy. So when we are developing drugs, if this criteria is made, the sponsor would consider uh, applying for breakthrough designation. Mm -hmm. Substantial, is that, uh, I mean, is, is that somewhat subjective? I mean, is there, a, is there a degree of subjectivity there? Yeah, you know, there, there are a couple of things we take into consideration, right? Uh, for us to consider an asset for this expedited review program, such as breakthrough designation, one, it needs to meet the criteria for treatment of a serious condition, and that definitely requires clinical judgment. Mm -hmm. Then there's the aspect of uh, whether the serious condition meets the criteria for unmet medical need, um, where, again, there is clear guidelines. So, say, example, targeted cancer therapies with novel mechanism of action, although they might appear to have uh, similar efficacy to the available therapies across the disease population, they could benefit patients that are no longer responding to the currently available uh, treatments. So uh, we then have to figure out what is the currently available standard of care. And maybe Shanti, uh, you can add uh, your context in terms of the regulatory definition of what an available therapy is. Sure, Ira. So um, an available therapy is considered a therapy that the FDA has approved and it is um, and, and it shows um, you know, in, that it's efficacious and it's safe to be used in the US population. So you know, we're gonna hear a lot of terminology as we probably go through today, but um, you know, an, a, a therapy that has an accelerated approval, and I'm not gonna get into that right now, 
but which is based on a surrogate endpoint, um, is not necessarily considered available therapy for the FDA. It is something that has is, is shown to be efficacious and safe, and it has what we call a full approval. Alternatively, sometimes FDA also considers standard of care as an available therapy if there is nothing approved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting segue uh, to, to another question for, for Dr. Gupa, uh, kind of on the same topic. Are there specific therapeutic areas, you know, and this ties into that regulatory comment that Dr. Ganeshan just made. Uh, are there specific therapeutic classes or, or disease indications that are more likely than others to garner favorable breakthrough, desi- breakthrough therapy designation outcomes? Um. I, I think so, because again, you know, uh, defining the criteria for serious condition, life-threatening uh, conditions is going to be uh, critical. So, you know, anti-infective treatments where uh, yeah, they've developed resistance and there is no other treatment options, oncology definitely being one of it. From, you know, from a clinical perspective, um, what is important is you're looking at a condition or a disease with morbidity or morbidity that has a substantial impact on the day-to-day functioning of the individual. So hence, uh, you know, the, the indications that are being looked at would be broad uh, depending on the disease area as well as the impact on patients' day-to-day living. Mm-hmm. Dr. Ganeshan, uh, Dr. Gupta earlier sort of indicated that um, there needs to be some substantial measurement in place, you know, to even consider uh, pursuing breakthrough therapy designation as an option. Um, that that would s- seem to me that uh, there'd be a correlation with sort of the clinical continuum, right? There'd be a certain time or space and time on that continuum when you'd say, um, you know, hey, maybe we should look at this or Wait, we got a lot of work to do before we even consider it. It's not even a consideration. So what are your thoughts on that? What's your, what's your advice around sort of the best practices for timing uh, and, and, and content of that? Well, to, we'll start with timing before we get into content. What's, what's you know, there, there's probably no standard answer. Um, well, um, very sort of structurally put, right, from a regulatory perspective, um, the timing or the application for breakthrough therapy can be submitted anytime after an IND is submitted, right? So long as it addresses everything that Dr. Gupta just mentioned, right? It sort of um, addresses all the all the different criteria, right? And I think there is perhaps one um, ex- exception to this, where there are more and more sponsors that are um, developing drugs first ex-US, right? And then they come into the US. So they may have some patient data XUS that could technically qualify for this breakthrough therapy criteria, in which case there are exceptions where you could submit the breakthrough therapy application along with your IND. Hmm. Okay. Is that, right. a, is that an exception? An exception well, it's, it, well, the FDA accepts um, XUS data. Right. There are there are guide um, there are guidelines and, and it's codified on what they expect from XUS clinical data. So so long as I think um, the country where you did the study or countries have similar standard of care and similar therapies, it could qualify. Yeah. So, again, this is something that you know you should discuss. But that's, I think, the only sort of caveat. But otherwise, if you have an IND in place you could submit a breakthrough therapy application anytime after that. Yeah. I mean, if I may add to that, Matt, I think to maximize the benefit of this program, because it does give you an opportunity to engage with the agency and get feedback, the sponsor should begin engagement with the agency as soon as they feel that their asset, the drug, is meeting the criteria for qualification into the breakthrough designation. And the sooner you engage with the agency, the more uh, opportunities you have to have a positive impact on your overall clinical development strategy. So for us, you know, when we are looking at these assets, it's extremely important to start engaging with the agency uh, prior to the study designing of the drug that's going to get you the initial approval as mm-hmm. a part of the break designation. So I think I think timing is definitely critical to maximize uh, the engagement with the agency and benefit the program. Yeah. Is there a, I mean, based on your experiences, do you see a, a, a typical sort of time frame or, or point that uh, is sort of almost expected? Like if, for instance, if, I, if I'm an analyst and I'm sitting back watching, you know, and, I'm, and I've, got, I've got my eyes out for 
you know, pending breakthrough therapy designation applications. Um, is there a certain point in the companies that I watch where I, I'd kind of sit back and go, okay, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen now. Well, in a, um, in, in an ideal scenario, you would like to get breakthrough therapy designation prior to your end of phase two or prior to a pre pivotal or registration discussion with the agency, mm -hmm. because then by at that point you've showed that your drug meets the different criteria that they've sort of set forth. And then you can work with the agency on, um, on, on the nuances of your clinical study design and how to uh, design it in such a way that you can you know, expedite the approval, if at all possible, to get the drug to the patients as quickly as possible. Yeah. So Dr. Ganesha, let me, let me stick with you on, on this. We'll, we'll kind of move away from timing to sort of, uh, you know, determining factors around whether or not to even pursue it. Um, you know, it's, it's one strategy or avenue of many, and we'll discuss those many a little bit later on. Um, but just kind of top of mind at this point, what, what are the pros and cons? What are the kind of top level pro and con considerations that I should be taking account? Even if I think, you know, hey, I, I, I potentially have a winner that meets those criteria. But before I dive in, I want to consider these things. Sure. So the one thing I would like to tell our audience is um, there is a lot of information out there on BTD that, um, that, that the FDA and different members of the FDA have, have sort of uh, spoken to. I think the sort of primary um, advantage or a pro once you get your BTD designation is, um, is FDA's commitment to the sponsor, because this is a place where they have sort of realized that yes, this product or this drug has the potential to address an unmet medical need in a life-threatening disease, and it's got very promising early clinical data, right? So you get the senior managers at the FDA who are committed and involved in this application. And um, again, you know, you, you get other benefits in terms of, you know, a, a rolling review, a priority review, as the program sort of matures into a submission state. But I think, you know, the first and foremost is the FDA's acknowledgement in the potential for the drug. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Gupta, did you want to add um, anything else? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with you. Uh, you know, from a clinical perspective, what the breakthrough designation process allows is for intensive guidance on an efficient drug development, starting as early as phase two. Right. So during these in, uh, interactions, the agency may suggest or we as sponsors may propose alternative uh, clinical designs that could lead to more efficient earlier drug development, such as maybe an adaptive design or working on surrogate endpoints, which could then generate the data because the agency is looking at early signs of substantial improvement. So instead of using progression free survival which is, or overall survival that is commonly used as an endpoint for registration, they would be willing to use overall response rate with uh, you know, deep and durable responses. So clearly there needs to be some follow-up that would allow us to uh, you know, take smart risks, if I may use that term, and bring medicines efficiently in a shorter duration to the patient. So for me, that is a key element from a clinical perspective. But as Shanti mentions, you do engage with the agencies on the overall development of the program including getting feedback on other aspects of drug development, maybe manufacturing, and if the asset has companion diagnostic, it all comes together collaboratively because the FDA ensures that this cross-functional engagement, not only with the sponsors, but also within their teams, occurs in a very efficient and timely manner. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could just add one more thing, Matt, yeah. I think in addition to what Dr. Gupta said, I think it's the ability for the sponsor um, to really have an ongoing dialogue with the FDA, right, throughout the development of the drug, right, because they've acknowledged that this drug has a lot of potential and you can request meetings and you, or, you know, even, even short calls with them. And for the most part, they are granted because they are also invested in, in, in this drug's development. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those are, you know, very compelling 
pros? Uh, what, what are, what are perhaps the cons? What are the, you know, sort of the, the red flags or, or cautionary tales you might tell uh, around uh, maybe being careful what you wish for? Maybe I can start with this, Shanti. Um, you know, from from my perspective, based on our experience, I think it is important for everyone to remember that the process is very resource intensive. You know, as I mentioned, there is an element of risk associated with taking this pathway because yes, it can facilitate efficient drug development, but it also increases the risk or a chance for rejection because the decisions are being made with small data sets and at times limited follow-up. Mm-hmm. So you have to find that balance to have both um, internal alignment uh, and the support to allow for this level of uh, engagement with the agency. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Ganeshan, were you going to add to that? No, I was actually going to just agree with her because I think, um, I think clearly in this space, there are a lot more pros than cons. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, otherwise, why, why do it? Right. Um, I, I do want to I do want to dwell for just a second on one of the, uh, you know, uh, cautions, I, I guess, that, that Dr. Gupta shared. And that's around uh, resource intensive, uh, a resource intensive exercise. Um, give us some flavor on that. When you when you say it's a resource resource intensive uh, exercise, what 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 resources can we expect to have to devote? Uh, to not just the application, but the follow through should, should it be accepted? I mean, um, Ira, did you want to start with that or did you want me to start with that? No, please close it. Go ahead. Okay. So I think from a sponsor, so it's resource intense from both parties, both the um, sponsor as well as the FDA. Mm-hmm. So from a sponsor perspective, right, you are doing a data cut that you were not perhaps planning to do, or you've got to clean the data for whatever you want to submit to the agency, right? You wanna make sure that, you know, there's integrity in the data that that you're submitting. So it's additional work that you weren't necessarily planning to do at that specific stage. And it's very difficult to plan for breakthrough therapy because you you don't know if it's gonna satisfy the conditions until you've started seeing some preliminary data. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think it's it's that early component um, where where you where you have to get the resources to submit the application from an FDA perspective, because this particular application involves review from senior level members of the FDA. It's it's intense because they have 60 days to review this application and it probably has to go through the review center. And then they make a recommendation to this um, to to the senior manager, or I think I've heard them say policy council. Mm -hmm. And and then they have to opine on the decision and then they have to get it back all within 60 days. Right. And if you look at all the, the number of applications, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head right now, but majority of the applications are rejected. Yeah. So. So I think given that, it's, it's a lot of work for, um, for the FDA and for the sponsors. I, uh, I set out uh, when, when I found you too, uh, I, I found you as I was on this search for, um, well, for, a, for, a, for a, a, a producer of biotherapeutics who has won breakthrough designation. And uh, I learned very quickly that there haven't been that many doled out in, in recent years. It's, it's, uh, it's not a common thing uh, by design, but for sure. So um, you can anticipate failure. And, and when you experience that failure, when you are rejected, uh, what's your, uh, I mean, yeah, obviously you can give up or you can, or you can chart your, uh, your you know, your, your, uh, your next attempt. Uh, what does that process look like though? What do you do when you're, when, what do you do when you're rejected? Well, um, the FDA is, is, is kind enough, I should say, when they reject your application, they will provide adequate justification on why they felt the application did not meet the standards for breakthrough therapy, mm-hmm. right? And whether it's, um, you know, there, there's various reasons that they could provide, whether it's, um, it's uh, you know, a small number of patients, the design wasn't appropriate. We could talk about some of this if you want in, in further detail. but you know, this should give the sponsor um, some idea of what additional information 
we should provide, right? If you were to go back and reapply, there is nothing that says that you cannot reapply. And based on personal experience, I don't necessarily know that if there's a formal um, appeal process here, right? It's If it's rejected, they'd be like, well, address our questions and reapply. Yeah. Right? But there is one thing that um, the FDA did a few years ago when they realized they were getting so many breakthrough therapy applications from across the board is they sort of um, instituted what I sort of call a two pager advice, right? And what this is, and, and, and it's, it's available on the website with, um, with, a, with a template. This is FDA's way of telling sponsors, if you think your drug would qualify for breakthrough therapy, send us a quick two pager mm-hmm. on, you know, just, just addressing the, the sort of highlights of, um, of, of your drug and some of the data you've seen. And we'll schedule a call with you, right, within a week or 10 days or so. And we'll discuss with you, and it's usually like 15 minutes long, on whether we think this qualifies for breakthrough therapy or not, right? Mm-hmm. And whether we would advise you to go ahead and submit the application. Now, this is not formal advice, right? This is an informal advice. So despite what they say, if you feel very strongly and they've said, you know what, we would still like to see X, Y, and Z or some more additional data, the sponsor is still you know, allowed to go ahead and submit the breakthrough therapy application, right? But it gives you a preliminary idea on where the FDA is. And I think, you know, this could um, uh, alleviate a lot of the resource intensiveness that we were talking about earlier, both on the sponsor side and the FDA side. Because then, you know, and there are times where they'll, they'll say, oh, no, we think this is really good. Go ahead and submit. So, I, I think it's it's a good temperature check, if you will, before you just full out go ahead. But you know, I've I've seen it happen both ways, and some get accepted, some get rejected. Yeah, the, the pre, sort of a pre screen opportunities certainly would would help kind of kind of give you some direction. Um, and I encourage my kids, like I, I think about my kids and in, in, in their academic careers. I encourage them all the time. If you're not satisfied w- with an outcome or an interaction, you know, don't don't just walk away from it and accept it for what it is. Go back and have a conversation with you know the, the teacher, whoever it might be, uh, to to learn why and learn what you can do better. Is is there that opportunity that I that I teach my kids with the FDA? You know, beyond beyond just the rejection letter and and maybe a few bullet points. Do you have the opportunity to go back to the FDA and say? Hey, I want to dig a little bit deeper here because we, we you know, we, it's our intent to to give this another go. Absolutely. I think there's always an opportunity to talk to the FDA. What will happen though is you have to go more through a formal meeting route. Mm-hmm. You can't get this response and pick up the phone and say, FDA, can we just talk to you tomorrow? Right. Right. But if you want to schedule a type C meeting with them, and, 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 you know, have a little more um, feedback, I think they will give it to you. And there could be certain review groups who would feel that their written response is satisfactory. I think, generally speaking, I think FDA wants to be as collaborative as possible with mm-hmm. sponsors. But sometimes it will depend on pre- other pressing activities and which other meetings may take precedence. Yeah. I shouldn't speak on behalf of them, but this is just based on my experience. Sure. Yeah. The business of biotech is brought to you in partnership with Cytiva. Together, we're committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Check out a host of useful resources for biotech leaders at Cytiva's Emerging Biotech Accelerator at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. Dr. Gupta, I want to I turn back to you with, a, with an interesting, another sort of philosophical question. Um, <laughs> big, wide open question that you can take in many directions, but it's around, you know, this, this concept that, uh, yeah, I, I made the analogy earlier or sort of drew the illusion, you know, let, let's say I'm an analyst and I'm watching the space. 
analysts and, and consultants and PR and Wall Street, everyone watches the space for regulatory movement, right? It's an indicator that just drives the engine. It drives the funding engine. It drives investments. It's often conflated to the point that I you know, try not to put too much stock in it. Still, breakthrough des- designation, uh, the, the process, the application process, being awarded that designation has big implications beyond just the the clinic, right? It's got big implications beyond just the therapy that we're discussing. It's got implications for the the future of the company, the funding of the company, so on and so forth. So, I want to I want to talk about that a little bit because it's got you know that impact can be super positive, could be potentially you know negative negative when you are rejected. What advice do you have for emerging biotechs around that, around managing? the public information around, you know, the entire process from application to, um, you know, outcome? It, it, it is a good question because I think as sponsors, we usually do a press release of the FDA granting us breakthrough designation and the FDA never does that. So if you go to the FDA um, website, you'll realize that FDA will never disclose information regarding sponsors who uh, made these requests and or if the application has been granted or denied. And I think this has to do with the fact that FDA cannot disclose the existence of an IND or any submission that has been made as a part of the IND application. Mm-hmm. However, you know, from the biotech world, from an industry perspective, we use this for uh, intelligence. It gives the sponsor an understanding of the status of other agents that might be developed in those uh, patient populations that meet the criteria for breakthrough designation. So um, that's the reason we follow it. And as Shanti was uh, mentioning, every every organization, irrespective of whether you meet the criteria and after meeting the criteria, if it doesn't get um, approved or allocated, has to have to take this as an opportunity to engage with the agency, get feedback, and then go back and see how their plans for the clinical development of the asset need to be uh, tweaked because it's not depending on what they're saying, right? The reason for denial could be uh, multi-pronged. It could be because of the lack of efficacy or there could be a safety concern and or the criteria for substantial improvement not being made. It will help you decide how you design your study to be able to get that data and again, re-engage with the agency. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that answers the uh, question in terms of um, the information about breakthrough designation could propel you in an accelerated mode or give you an opportunity to pause and reevaluate the strategy and tweak it. Yeah, I would almost so, and, and I I, per, I I respect that immensely. In fact, you know, I've I've had many conversations with uh, with the leaders of, of biotech uh, companies who, you know. W- you know, we, 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 we've, we, we've sat around and lamented the fact that there's no celebration of, of failure when there should be, right? Like we should be celebrating failure. Um, the PR world doesn't necessarily, the, the IR world in particular doesn't necessarily celebrate uh, failure. So I guess the only follow-up question I would have would be like, um, to what degree do you advise uh, companies who are are going through this process to sort of meter the output of public information on on their breakthrough therapy uh, designation application or status, um, just to kind of you know manage the perception of wins and losses. Is is it important? I I, I think it is an important aspect of the drug development process, but one needs to remember that the FD has numerous mechanisms. So I think uh, Shanti can talk a lot more to it, but you know, there are four FDA programs that have the intention to facilitate and expedite the drug development uh, review process. And therefore, you know, not getting one does not necessarily mean that there are, there aren't other routes to continue developing the drug and bringing it to the patients. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think um, I think Ira, thanks for that segue. I think it's it's a very good point that you mentioned because, um, you know, we have fast track designation, also, which sort of was superseded by breakthrough therapy, if you will. But fast track, you know, does not have I would say such high bar because you don't really need that much clinical data to get fast track designation. But it, at the same time, does tell the agency that this drug has potential. Mm-hmm. So as, as Ira just mentioned, I think 
there are other mechanisms and and I don't think companies should um, should lose heart if they don't get a breakthrough therapy designation because they could still get it later in development Mm -hmm. or alternatively they could rely on fast track designation and other mechanisms to while they're developing their drug. Yeah. Let's uh, let's linger there for a minute, Dr. Ganesh, and and kind of lay out in, I guess, as, as clear terms as possible, the distinction between fast track breakthrough therapy and, and whatever, else, you know, whatever other applicable designations kind of align with those. And uh, just, just a, a more clear understanding of, of what they are might help uh, help our audience sort of determine which, which path to take, what's, what's most appropriate. Sure. I'm going to talk a little bit maybe more about accelerated approval and priority review and defer the differences between fast track and breakthrough therapy to Dr. Gupta, if that's okay with you. Um, So you get to hear both of us and both of our perspectives. Yeah. Uh, So, um, you know, I think for for an accelerated approval, and and I think this terminology is, is, is important to keep in mind because you often hear, oh, this drug is on an accelerated path or, you know, we're accelerating the development. And what does that necessarily mean? Right. Because I, because I think that's very different than an accelerated approval. Mm -hmm. So an accelerated approval is a mechanism that was, I believe, codified in the early um, uh, 1992 sort of timeframe that um, if you had a drug that treated a serious condition and generally provides a meaningful advantage over available therapies, right? Um, There is a a possibility to get it to market earlier for patients. And, and And the distinction really is an accelerated approval is based on what we consider a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefits, right? And if you take oncology, overall survival is the gold standard right, for for an approval of a drug. Mm -hmm. But sometimes given these serious conditions, we often want to get these drugs earlier to market. So you could potentially um, consider overall response rate and see if that usually is a surrogate uh, that would predict overall survival. So Mm -hmm. you could have a smaller study that looks at response rate and you could get accelerated approval, get the drug on the market while you're doing what is called a confirmatory study or you're studying a more traditional endpoint like an overall survival, right? But it allows you to get the drug earlier. Right. Priority review is a mechanism to allow the FDA, again, for a drug that treats a serious condition and it could have a significant improval, uh, uh, improvement over other drugs. It allows them to review the application in a shorter amount of time. So while you could have discussions with um, the agency on would you know these results lend itself to accelerated approval, and they might say, it seems likely, but it depends on the data and the review, after you submit your application and in your application, you request a priority review because you say, my drug is treating a serious uh, life-threatening condition, et cetera. And with your filing communication after 60 days, they will tell you if it's being reviewed under priority review. And if for a normal standard um, enemy application, that's eight months. Or if it's a standard review, it's 12 months. Mm-hmm. So these are a couple of the um, benefits that you get, you know, to accelerate drug development. Yeah. And and Ira, I'm going to throw it over to you for the other two. Uh, Sure, Shanti. Thank you. So I think think from our our experience, um, the criteria is very similar between uh, um, the fast track as well as uh, breakthrough designation. The difference being, as Shanti had mentioned, for for fast track, the drug not only has to be used for the treatment of serious conditions, but in the presence of non-clinical data that is demonstrating the potential uh, to address an unmet, uh, unmet medical need, you can start engaging with the agency. 
so this type of engagement will ideally not will will ideally happen no later than the pre bla or a pre nda meeting whereas for the breakthrough designation you have to you need clinical data that is demonstrating substantial improvement on a clinically significant endpoint over the available therapy so that's where durability of response while using overall response rate in a clinical study with an oncology is something that could be used and these um, meetings will occur no later than the end of phase 2 so there's a difference in from a timing perspective when it comes to engagement with the agencies um, etc it is very similar in terms of the fact that with, with fast track you will have opportunities to engage with the agencies participate in rolling reviews as well as find ways to expedite the drug development but the level of engagement and interaction with the agency is more intensive to allow us to engage with the agency with the breakthrough designation than uh, you know in, in my opinion with fast track uh, designation so those are some of the differences that uh, you know the biotech world the, the sponsors can take into consideration when deciding one uh, route over the other yeah uh, a, a, a sort of a personal question just popped into my head is okay with I, if with you guys if i ask you it's sort of a personal kind of you know not not personal personal but personal from a career perspective right from a position perspective can i can i throw this at you if you don't want to answer just say no sure okay. go ahead so in the roles that you play uh in develop you know developmental and and regulatory uh senior level capacities um where does the pressure come from to pursue breakthrough opportunities, fat, fast track opportunities? Um, <laughs> I don't expect you to name names, <laughs> <laughs> but is there pressure, I guess? I mean, is there pressure kind of coming at you from, from you know, the, the marketing side, the commercial side, the, even the development side, fans, fans of the therapies that, uh, you know, champions of the therapies? Um, do, 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 you, do you feel that pressure corporately? I can take it first. So having Dr. Worked, Gupta is, Dr. Gupta is like, please, Dr. Gradation, you can take <laughs> it. You can, you, can, you can take it and you can keep it because I'm not going to go there. <laughs> um, having worked at a startup and in, in uh, big pharma, right? I think there's a difference. I think if it's more of a smaller biotech -y, startup, I think the pressure comes from the top, mm -hmm. right? Because um, expectation. It, it, exactly, right? You're, you're much closer. I think in large pharma, when we start developing drugs, right, um, potential to assess for breakthrough therapy or priority review, it's sort of, I would say, inbuilt into the clinical development plan, right? That maybe at the end of phase one data, we can assess, right? Do we qualify? Or is that a good time to think about it, right? I think the accelerated approval and priority review come a little later. Mm -hmm. I mean, accelerated approval, I guess, could come as early as early as end of phase one because you can submit phase one data for approval in oncology. It's, it's been sort of done and dusted and tested, right? But the priority review has to come at the time of the application. Yeah. Right, based based on it. So, so I don't I don't necessarily think um, there's a right or a wrong, but I just feel like in large pharma it's sort of inbuilt into the drug development process, and and it's almost up to the team, the development team, to sort of escalate to management to say, oh, we are requesting breakthrough or we've received breakthrough, okay, as opposed to the other way around. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting insight. Yeah, I mean, I, I only add to the piece that most of us are working to bring the most effective medicines to patients because there's a high unmet ne medical need, especially, you know, for those conditions that would glorify uh, for breakthrough designation. And that's usually driven our need, whether, you know, it's at a study team level or at a senior management level within the pharma industry. We want to do right by the patient. And should you come across an, um, an asset a drug that can meet that criteria, then why not take advantage or um, you know engage with the agency and see if there are ways of bringing uh, medicines to patients um, while generating the appropriate data as efficiently and as quickly as possible. 
So for me, this that's been the piece that's driving it. And now that the mechanism is in place, it allows us to have those conversations and then be able to generate the data and allocate resources uh, to get this done. So mm -hmm. for me, that's been the piece uh, that has been um, the driving force, not necessarily pressure one way or the other. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you both for entertaining that question. I, it just occurred to me and I, I, I was... I was hoping you'd be give give me some transparent in, insight, and you did. Um, we're running a bit short on time here. Just time for a couple more questions for you both, uh, Doctor Ganesh. I wanted to ask you to sort of give us our audience a an overview of what FDA's Project Orbis is and how it plays into this conversation we're having around uh, breakthrough therapy designation. So I'll I'll be very short, and then and then you know if if you feel you want any more. Um, depth into it, I'm happy to elaborate um, in the interest of time. Sure. But um, Project Orbis is something that the FDA piloted and it's still in, in the pilot phase, but this was FDA's way of working with other health authorities to see, especially for drugs that where there's a um, life-threatening disease, unmet medical need, to, to sort of share some of the lessons learned and how they could work together to get these products approved, right? And um, right now there are about six or seven countries. And, and for some of your listeners who are interested in Project Orbis, there was an FDA Grand Rounds that was done in May that's available um, that, that they could listen to. And it goes into quite, quite a bit of detail here, but it, it, it gives that collaborative um, uh, uh, format for these countries. Everybody makes their own decisions. Everybody makes their own labeling decisions, but it allows them to discuss the application. And there are some countries which are fairly small and they may not have the review staff that the FDA have, mm -hmm. right? So, or some of the other countries. So I think this allows them to sort of work with each other and, um, and, and, and sort of enable the review. And it's still, like I said, it's still under pilot, um, under, under a pilot process, but just because you qualify for Orbis, um, it doesn't mean that you're excluded from the other expedited pathways in the U.S. Yeah. You yeah. can still be reviewed under Project Orbis and still get an accelerated approval or a priority review or any one of those that we spoke about. Mm -hmm. Is that something that uh, our listeners can um, ju just just Google or go on FDA's website and do a search for Project Orbis and it'll pop up? Or do yeah. you want to share? I, I was going to say, a good question for you both would be to share your screens and show us all the bookmarks that you have tabbed in the top of your, your browsers, you know, <laughs> direct insight to the places you most frequently visit. No, and, and I'm more than happy, Matt, after um, I could share um, links to the FDA websites if there's any way to share it with your audience. Yeah, that's perfect. I want to... Um, I want to wrap up with uh, with uh, a quick question of each of you, and we'll start with you, Dr. Gupta. What's your what's your simply your 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 best advice for? Um, I'm not even going to say for for winning, right? Like that's you know that's that's a pretty that's a pretty bold question to ask and a bold question to answer. What's your best advice for uh, biopharma pros who are uh, endeavoring to apply? for breakthrough therapy designation? So it's a, a simple, maybe, maybe it's even a mindset. What, what's your, what's your uh, you know, how would you mentor that, mentor them on that question? For me, drug development is a partnership between the regulatory agencies, um, the, you know, the treating physicians and the advocacy groups, as well as the sponsor. And I think being open to having those engagements very early on, getting insights from a patient perspective, from a treating physician's perspective, and not hesitating to engage with the FDA is the key to success to allow us to bring medicines to patients. Very nice. Perfect. Dr. Ganesh, how about yourself? So I will take the question specific to breakthrough therapy, as I think Ira, Ira said it the best from a drug development perspective. I think specific to breakthrough therapy is um, I would really look at the data and, and I would say, you know, do you have sufficient information? You know, there's enough information out there to see if you could qualify. Um, so, but I would really, really encourage um, sponsors to utilize this preliminary advice. It's, um, it, it's very helpful and it will give you insights into what the agency is thinking. 
And it may, you know, if, if you have a little more work to do, it may take an additional four or five months. They may say it would be great if we had follow up for six months for all of your patients yeah. and you're at four months, right? It's another two months. You might be able to wait that extra two to three months, get the data that's going to guarantee you um, breakthrough therapy designation as opposed to submitting it early on. So um, I, I think there's so much experience now that um, I think it's, it's very doable and I think um, FDA works with you, but you definitely need the data. They have clear criteria. Yeah. I, and I, and I like that advice. It is very practical um, and it's good advice because, you know, to your point, there's enough information out there to see if you qualify. Right. And yet so many apply and, and are rejected. So it's, it's, it's sound advice. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation. You two have been a, a wealth of knowledge and insp- insight and inspiration. I think uh, you've provided some really great information for our audience, and I've I've enjoyed talking with you both. Same here. Like thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you for for joining me, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Ganesh, and I really really did enjoy it. That's GSK's Dr. Ira Gupta and Gilead's Dr. Shanti Ganeshan. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva. If you're not already subscribed to my newsletter, please visit me at bioprocessonline.com and sign up for it. And check out Cytiva's Biotech Accelerator at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech, which is constantly replenished with new resources to aid you in your journey. Finally, if you're benefiting from the conversations you're hearing on the business of biotech, please hit that subscribe button. Give us five stars. And in the meantime, thanks for listening.